Good morning. Welcome to Oasis at Conway Gardens. I'm Eric Loudermilk and I serve as the interim pastor. Welcome to July 4th Sunday. It's good to see everybody. If you're a visitor uh, and would like to log your visit with us, you can pull up oasisconwaygardens.org on your smartphone and click I'm new and register your visit with us. Or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring you a visitor's card. It's good to see everyone. Good to see you, Faye. You feeling a little better this week? A little bit? That's good. That's good. Well, we're going to begin this morning uh, with worship, and uh, Jeremy and the worship band is going to come and lead us as we get started. Good morning. Sing a song about how much God loves us and that we can come to him with any of our problems, any of our issues that we may have, now's the time to just lay them down at the foot of the cross.
last week, oh, you may be seated, I'm sorry. Last week I left my backpack with some things at the house and had to have it brought to me. Today I forgot the announcements. So that's why the band was scrambling to get on stage. I just skipped the announcements without thinking. Stephanie, tell me when this is where you want it. It's good? Okay. So uh, for our guest, I, I am an absent-minded pastor, and it's just part of who I am. So we are in the middle of a series on loving our neighbors as ourselves. We are using the book Just Walk Across the Room by Bill Hybels as a little bit of a guide. There may be some new copies in the back. Uh, we ordered some more this week because what we had was snatched up and taken home. So the announcements that I missed is that next Sunday we'll have a business meeting after church for a short period of time, and we're going to do a slight question and answer during that time because people probably have a lot of questions since we reopened um, post-pandemic. And um, so stick around next week a little bit for that. Uh, starting this Wednesday, Wednesday nights in July, we will have a volunteer development night. Uh, we'll have some games and, and so forth, a little bit of training. And on the last Wednesday in July, July 28th, we'll have a volunteer appreciation dinner. So if you have volunteered recently, are volunteering, or want to volunteer in the church, you can do that. You can come with us. We'd love to have you. Finally, on July 15th, we're going to have, uh, at 6 p.m., a churchwide prayer meeting, praying for our community. So I really uh, urge you to come. Today, we're going to uh, open by reading Luke 10, 27. Luke chapter 10, just one verse. Stand with me for the reading of God's Word. So this is what we talked on last week, and... We're starting by saying, why do we love our neighbors? And the reason we love our neighbors is here in Luke 10, 27. It's the second most important commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, last week we learned that loving our neighbors is a matter of the heart. And our hearts can only be changed by God through prayer and repentance. And so we spent time at these altars last week praying and repenting of that sin that comes up on us so often. Now don't think that repenting one time over a sin night like not loving your neighbors is a one-time deal. If you can repent of that and change your behavior and never repent, have to repent or ask God again, you're a better man than I or a better woman than I. Right, Marion? So uh, just get used to having to ask God to help you there. Um, so this week, though, we're going to turn and focus on the practical side of developing relationships with our neighbors. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this morning. Uh, thank you for all the lovely rain we're getting and how green our grass is. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would be with us today, that you would anoint the message. Lord, that your words would come out, Lord, and that I can hide in the power of the cross, Lord. Please be with us today, Lord, and anoint your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A song Jeremy had us sing is a very, very good song. You bring all your addictions, all your failures, and whoever believes in him has eternal life, will live forever. God forgives. All we have to do is, is sincerely ask him to forgive us as our sins. I want to tell you a story about a friend Patty and I spoke to a few years back and how that came about. Before I tell you this story, I want to tell you that all the stories I'm using today, to my knowledge, are about people that, as far as we know, have never accepted Christ. But it's because for every story you hear me say that, oh, I talked to someone and they came to church, or I talked to someone and they really had questions and wanted to learn more about the Lord, there's probably a hundred others that all I did was love them. We were friends with them. And to drive that point home today, all the stories I've chosen are stories of people that, as far as we know, have never made a decision to follow Jesus. And I want to drive home the point that we're to love our neighbors regardless and not to get discouraged in doing so. I've changed the names in these stories to uh, just because I don't have these people's permission to share their names. But 
We used to live in an apartment complex over by the Millennia Mall called Aqua at Millennia. And there's a big lake out there. And Patty was in probably Tennessee visiting the grandkids. And I was uh, walking in the mornings. Um, And one morning, I was walking our dog, Lucy. You guys do know about our dog named Lucy. On bad days, her name is Lucifer. Okay, just checking to see if you're awake. I know it's raining outside. (laughs) And uh, as dogs do, I come across someone else with a dog. And our dog had to stop and check out that dog. And uh, so I said hello to this young woman. And I said, hi, my name's Eric. And she said, well, my name's Aubrey. I didn't ask for her name. I just told her my name. And I, I went about my way. And I, I was doing about three laps that day. And every time I went by, the dog, Lucy, would stop and exchange greetings with her dog, as dogs do. And then this repeated itself two or three times that week. After a while, you know, we would pause just a couple moments and share a word. And I found out she lived in our building. And I was careful to mention that my wife was away and would be back. Uh, Good practice, guys or or ladies, when you're talking to someone of the opposite gender. So when Patty came back, she was looking for a a walking partner. Um, And next thing you know, Patty and Aubrey... Uh, we're walking the lake together. Uh, I think some of the good days, they would they'd burn up six miles walking out there. And this went on for a couple months. Now, what's strange to uh, those of us who consider ourselves Bible-believing Christians in America is that I'm going to tell you, I don't think we ever did any overt sharing of Jesus with Aubrey. We just loved on her. We were just fulfilling the second commandment of loving your neighbor as yourself. And there's a skill set you learn. You ask about them, uh, you, get to, you talk about them and not yourself. And people like to when you're interested in them. And one day, uh, after learning what I did for a living, I you know, teach, the, the college was right there, and they find out I teach Bible and ministry classes. Aubrey up and says to Patty one day, so what's it mean to be saved? What's it mean to be saved? And so through that relationship, uh, Patty was able to share the gospel with her, and, and sometimes the three of us would walk and we talked a little bit more. Now, to our knowledge, uh, Aubrey has never accepted Christ. We're Facebook friends with her, and she does talk about the Lord, um, and maybe she has, but we don't know for certain that she hasn't, and we really hoped she would that summer, but she did not. So today we're going to talk about welcoming welcome home our series loving our neighbors as ourselves let's go to the next slide and this was a four-week series this is the second week and uh, today we're talking about the first d in living in 3d the book talks about living in 3d and the 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 d today is developing relate friendships developing friendships but there are practical reasons why we don't develop friendships and let's go over those really quick The first practical reason we don't develop friendships is technology. We used to live in West Palm, a beach, and we lived, um, it was uh, uh, housing provided by the university, and and we lived about four or five blocks from the the intercoastal. I don't want you to think I was living in a million-dollar mansion that professors make that kind of money. Um, But we lived in an older historic home provided by the university, built in uh, 1920. 1918, I think, or so. And our our air conditioner broke down, and the university uh, heating and ventilation repairman came over, and and we were, it was hot this summer, and I was talking to him, and I said, how in the world did people live before air conditioners? Oh, he said, oh, it was easy. It was very easy. See, my house had what was called a sleeping porch. Does anyone remember sleeping porches in Florida? Faye, yeah. And he said, uh, before all of this, these high-rises weren't here. And you had a coastal breeze, and you slept outside. You see, before technology, we spent a lot more time outside. In my uh, undergraduate psychology class, uh, my professor, Jack Sharp, um, was trying to teach us a lesson. I'm not even sure if I remember what the lesson was. Maybe that sometimes there's a simple answer to things. And he asked the class why there was a population surge in Florida in the 1960s. 
And we went on and on and on with, with answers, you know, the hippie movement and all kinds of ideas. And after 10 minutes of letting us wrestle, he said, no, it's very simple, air conditioning. So Florida was populated with, because of air conditioning. People was, were able to afford that and come here. But with air conditioning, we go inside. Whereas many of us grew up, uh, or our parents grew up, sitting on the porch. And when the neighbors came by, you said hello, right? Remember those days? Yeah. It was a good time. And then, of course, we have smartphones. And uh, let's see, how many of you young people, I know my wife just started this, uh, track your screen time on your phone? Jackie, let, let's see what yours is this week. I haven't looked. I'm going to pick on Jackie. Screen time. Jeremy, I think you're in on this too, right? Have, come on. How much screen time? Oh, really? Jackie, what are you at this week? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, my average a week or so ago was five hours. That was pretty bad. Um, this week, oh, you know, it starts on Sunday, <laughs> and I did sermon prep this morning. So my daily average today is an hour and 17 minutes. But we, we have this app on our phone to track how many hours we spend on our phone because we found out that we spend too much time on our phones. And what are we not doing when we're doing this? We're not talking to the person across from the table. Or we text our neighbor. We have a neighbor, Tim. He's played piano for us a few times. Before texting, we would have to go over and knock on the door to talk to Tim, and now we can text him. Or we work from home on our computers. We work in our cubbies. And technology keeps us from spending our time with our friends. And instead of decreasing our screen time, we need to increase our neighbor time. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's important. And I think you have to be intentional. And to be honest with you, I don't think this is an accident. I think the enemy, I think Satan knows exactly what he's doing. Now, I don't like pastors who say there's a devil under every rock or a demon under every rock, but I don't think it's any accident. In the 60s or the 50s, when computers were just around the corner, researchers predicted that in 20 years we wouldn't have a five-day work week or people wouldn't have an eight-hour eight, eight work day because computers would save us so much time we would be all caught up. That's not the case, is it? Myron, you love email, right? At work. You love it. That's right. All right. The second practical reason I think we don't develop friendships is that we were taught to be afraid of strangers. Don't talk to strangers. Now, I think everyone in here is old enough that we can talk to strangers. Logan, can, can you talk to strangers now? Are you our youngest? Either you, William, uh, either you, Sam, or Joseph was our youngest. But we're adults. And I think we should talk to strangers. A good role model in my life is an, a colleague I had years ago named Kat. And Kat never knew a stranger. And just being around her, I learned to read name tags. I learned to speak to people um, as friends. Now, proof that we can change our mindset in talking to strangers, and I didn't get permission. I'm going to use you as an example. Patty just wants to hide under the pew when I do this. One day, uh, Patty's extremely shy, extremely shy. She's not very happy right now that I'm doing this. I get home from work, and she says, did you see those two Arab men who moved into the building today? I said, no. She goes, yeah, I saw them in the elevator, and I could tell they, they weren't around from here. So I said, hi, my name's Patty. Welcome to the building. I said, who are you? What in the world did you do with my wife? So you can change your mentality over time and learn to develop friendships uh, out of your shell. Now, that doesn't mean you won't have some cultural snafus. Um, there are things you can learn as a skill set. Now, a skill is not a talent. Uh, it's, it's not a fact you memorize. It's something you do over and you get better at it. And one of the things I've learned is I'm a little too outgoing. And if I try too hard, I will scare people away. So I no longer ask people their name. All I do is say, well, hi, my name's Eric, and I leave it at that. And probably 70% of the people will go, well, my name's so-and-so. And that's how you meet people. One of the cultural snafus uh, that I have made is, is men aren't supposed to look an Arab woman in the eye and especially not shake her hand. 
and I was at a conference uh, sharing, uh, promoting a booth for the university, and there was an Arab woman there promoting her university, and sure enough, I stuck my hand out, and uh, she said, no, I'm sorry, I can't shake your hand, and I apologized because I knew better. Well, before the conversation was over, I stuck my hand out again. But, but people are kind and loving, and they are usually very glad that you look them in the eye and value them as a human. And when they find out, you know, hey, that person's a Christian, you've changed their mentality a little bit. The fourth and final practical reason I wanted to share with you that we don't develop friendships is that many times, not always, but many times, as we get older in our journey with Christ, we spend less time with people who are far from God. Now, I know this is hard to see. We had trouble finding a fat marker today. But uh, let's say this is people over here, the number of people you uh, spend time with, and this is time going this way. And what we find is when someone first decides to follow Jesus, they have all the same friends. But because they want to change certain things in their life, maybe they are bad temptations for them, they change their crowd. And so what happens is over time, we forget about the people who don't know the Lord, and we spend less and less time with them, unless we're intentional. All the while, we're growing in our knowledge and understanding and our faith and joy of our faith. So often when we're walking with the Lord the most, we have this huge gap between us and our friends who are far from God. This huge gap between us and our friends who are far from God. So what I want to tell you today is that we have to be intentional about building relationships with our neighbors who are far from God. We have to be intentional. And so today we want to talk about the first D in the 3D approach, and that's developing friendships. So these are very, very practical tools, not very spiritual today. Last week we, we dumped the whole hayload on you. Today we're just going to give you a nibble. First, how to spend more time with our friends. Just introduce yourself and leave it at that. Just introduce yourself and leave it at that. In today's American post-Christian pagan culture, if someone finds out you're a Christian, and especially if you identify as a conservative Christian or evangelical, your neighbor already has a preconceived notion that you're going to attack them, that you're going to verbally berate them until they convert to Christianity or whatever. And that's just the post-Christian world we live in. Now, Don, I didn't prepare you, but was that true in the 50s? No, because we are a Christian culture in the 50s. This is not even post-Christian anymore. This is a pagan nation that is anti-Christian. And that's just the reality of it. And while many so-called Christians are trying to take back the nation for God in, in violent ways, that creates a stereotype that you're fighting against. So just introduce yourself to them. When we lived at this apartment complex, we parked at generally the same spot every day. And most people in this apartment complex parked in the generally same spot because the parking garage had several entrances to it and several floors. And so you parked on the floor next to the interest, entrance closest to your unit. And we uh, noticed there was a man there driving a very big four-wheel drive Dodge pickup, and he had an old classic car. I don't even remember what it was. And a lot of times we were going in or coming out from our apartment the same time he was. And so I just said, nice car. And um, my son is named William. And we were just getting into cars at that time. And uh, after a couple of pass-bys, I said, well, you know, what year is it? You know, and so forth. And he stopped to talk. And so that's when I said, well, my name's Eric. And this is my son, William. And William, our neighbor, said, well, that's interesting. My name's William, too. And he was a quiet man. But a conversation was started. Over time, we talked a little bit more. We actually helped each other on a couple of car projects. And the relationship grew to the point that we finally felt 
we were comfortable enough to invite him in our home. And we did, and that night we shared the Lord with him. He wasn't that receptive, and he eventually moved out of the apartment complex. But we were very careful to show him a side of being a Christian that was just loving him as a neighbor. And he's been introduced to the Lord, and that's one step along the way. Um, you say, well, I'm pretty shy. I'm, I'm painfully shy. Well, that's fine. You can write a card and welcome someone to your neighborhood. Or if your neighbor is sick, you might can mow the yard while the spouse is in the hospital. It doesn't have to be a certain way. It just needs to be your way of loving your neighbor. One of the best things I think you can do is to walk regularly. Go outdoors and walk. Uh, walk for your health. I myself prefer walking for prayer time. Um, I just find it a little easier. And if I see someone on the walk who has something in common with me, I'll just try to politely and not intrusively comment on that. Oh, that's a nice dog. May I pet your dog? Oh, that's a, that's a nice car or something. I love your, your landscaping and so forth. Which leads to my next point. I actually thought, of, thought about titling this entire sermon, this point, just by a dog. Now, cat lovers, I, I, I don't know. You're out. I'm, I'm sorry. In fact, I don't think dogs were created in creation. I think they came up after the f- cats, that is, came up after the fall into sin. They must have not have been a part of original creation. Cat lovers will get that. <clears throat> we have a neighbor, and I'm going to call her Bonnie, and her dog I'm going to call Bubba, although I don't think his, he would care if I used his name, but again, I don't want to violate their privacy. And Bonnie's uh, getting up in years, and she often has to walk Bubba. She has a tricycle, uh, an adult tricycle, and she'll put B- uh, Bub- Bubba, <laughs> about to say the wrong name, on a leash and walk him. And the, I love this dog. This dog has the thickest fur I've seen. And so I have to go pet the dog. Now, I wasn't a dog lover until my lovely wife forced Lucifer, I mean Lucy, on us. And something has changed. I like dogs. So I really don't like passing a dog up without petting him. And so the first time I stopped and petted Bubba, his fur is so rich. Well, the funny thing is that when you pet Bubba, he barks (laughs) out of happiness and the harder you, the, the more rigorous you pet him, the louder he barks, right? And we've gotten to know her. And uh, in the time that we've lived in that subdivision, she has fallen ill and been in the hospital. And I was able to go visit her and pray with her in the hospital. Now, to, to my knowledge, Bonnie has not made any faith commitment. She has visited Oasis before. But the goal, if you see someone as a evangelism project i'm going to convert this person that's not love that is i'm going to check this person off of my box and make myself feel better for the kingdom of god loving is giving them whatever they need at the moment if they need their yard mode if they need their dog sat if they just need an encouraging hug you ever thought about the fact when 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 in mark jesus says let the children come to me if you go back and read that It says he put his hands on them. He took them in his arms. Sometimes the best step of evangelism you can give someone is to give them a hug. Now, I'll give one little caveat here about these simple tasks to loving your neighbors. It's easier if you live in a subdivision. It's more difficult if you live in an apartment complex. When we lived in the apartment complex, we would just get to know our neighbors and get to a relationship with them, and then they would move. So our friend Aubrey now lives, I think, in Ohio. William moved back to West Virginia. And that was very, very common to have a a sort of, we lived in a transient space. A lot of people come to Orlando. They'll get an apartment their first few months of their new job and then so forth. And for those on Facebook, uh, especially my family, if you live in a rural area, it's a little different. It's not like if you walk the dog, you're going to see six people in your neighborhood every day. Another tip is to eat at the same restaurant, sit at the same booth, frequent that place, and 
live your faith in front of them in a way that's appropriate for you. Now, Patty is not very vocal, and, and, but she would be kind to people. If she was an eater, out, or a loner kind of a person like I am, she would just sit there and love and be kind and if something happens. Now, for me, I'm often grading papers or sometimes preparing a sermon. And so the server, the hostess, or the waiter or waiters will say, oh, what you working on? And I'll say, oh, I'm grading papers. They'll say, what do you teach? I teach Bible. Or, the, or I'm preparing a sermon. And I leave it at that. Because they're waiting for you to pounce on them. And when you don't, nine times out of ten, their curiosity will get them. I was going to save this story till next week, but I'll go ahead and share it this week. A few years ago on the hiking trail, um, whenever you get into town, uh, hikers are looking for four words, all you can eat. You know, you go days on the trail eating dehydrated foods, hiking lots of miles, and you come into a town and you just want to eat all you can. It's not uncommon to sit down and order one main course, eat it, and then order another. I kid you not, because they say actually uh, long-distance hikers, obviously I'm not that long-distance, but long-distance hikers can't actually pack enough calories in their pack pack if they hike constantly. So I was at one of these such meals, and a lot of the trail towns will have backcountry outfitters and restaurants catering to hikers, and I was in an outfitter store, and uh, it had been raining, and there was a woman there who was obviously a hiker, and we're muddy, and we got on our hiking clothes, and uh, I don't remember who said what, but somehow one of us introduced ourselves, and we said, let's eat with the, these other hikers eating at this restaurant. So I was with my son-in-law and another hiker who we had hiked with for two or three days, and he knew what I did, and he was a Christian, and he just went sort of on and on and on about God and Christianity. And I was, to be honest with you, this is going to sound bad, but because of these techniques, I was a little nervous. Because here we have a stranger, she doesn't know anything about me, and this guy is doing a one-sided conversation all about God, all about God, while we're ignoring her. So I'm trying to be uh, judicious and value everyone at the table and talk, and I acknowledged him, but I really didn't carry that conversation of faith. So as it turned out, though, everybody I was hiking with was getting off the trail, and everybody she was hiking with was getting off the trail. So the next day on the trail, we found ourselves hiking together, which is very common. You run into people and back and forth on the trail. So we're talking, and we get to our first water stop. We're at a creek. We're filtering our water. And she says to me, so if, if there's a God, wh why does he allow so much evil in the world? You see, I didn't start the conversation. She heard what I did for a living, and I didn't beat her over the head with the Bible, and she initiated the conversation. And that conversation was continued at two or three restaurants over the next couple of days. We're Facebook friends to this day, and, and I've actually shared a book with her. But she hasn't come to the Lord either. But I have nonetheless loved my neighbor as myself and tried to bless her. What about when you're in Publix or Walmart? Uh, Walmart's my favorite because you can just about guarantee that if someone is working a cashier, a cash register at Walmart, they don't want to be there, right? And so one of my favorite things to do is to read their name tag and, and just say, Hi, Stephanie, how's it going today? And if they're tired, which is like 80% of the time, I'll say, I'm, I bet you're going to be glad when this shift is over. That's all you got to say. I've done that countless of times. And while that doesn't often lead to any deepening of a relationship, what it does is it changes me. It teaches me I can call a stranger by name and give them a kind word. And because this is a skill set, it's not an overnight fix. I'm training myself to love my neighbor as myself, just by naming their name tag and so forth. It's a good way to work on your stuff. Now, um, last week, um, I was over around the church for something, and I had to go somewhere, I don't remember where, but I stopped at the Dairy Queen up here. Now, the doctor does like me to eat fish, 
That's one thing I do right. And Dairy Queen has the best fish sandwich in the world. So I stopped into Dairy Queen. I chose not to do the drive through And um, I'm waiting for my food, and the woman has a, an accent. And to me, any accent is a lovely accent, especially North Carolina. But hers wasn't. I actually thought it was like Eastern European. And so while we're waiting for the food, I read her name tag. I've already forgotten it. And I said, where's that lovely accent from? That's all I said. And she said, Pakistan. And I said, oh, that's so nice. And um, we were waiting a little longer. I said, well, how long have you been in the U.S.? She said, 10 years. And because of what we see in the media, my next question is, how have you been treated here? How have you liked your time? And she says, it's wonderful. I've, I've really enjoyed it here. And I don't normally do this, but the church is close, and I figured she lives in the neighborhood. So I finally said, well, my name's Eric, and I'm the interim pastor at Oasis Church just down the corner. I said, if you're ever looking for a church, come join us. So that's a place I'll probably go back to again, and if I see her again, just continue to be kind to her. All right, enough of those little uh, tricks. Next slide, William. One of the best things I know to do is to give someone a book. Um, there's different ways to do this. They can be a stranger, but somehow you feel that they would like to read it or they're going through grief. Um, C.S. Lewis has a very good book called A Grief Observed that I have given to people who don't know the Lord or they do know the Lord and they're wrestling through grief. This book is called uh, Letters to a Skeptic by Dr. Greg Boyd. And uh, Greg became a believer in Jesus in college and went on to study in seminary and become a pastor. But his father, Ed Boyd, was not a believer. And every time father and son would talk about matters of faith, they would have an argument. And Greg, loving his dad, finally decided, I'm going to write him a letter and see if that will work. They didn't live in the same town. So he wrote him a letter and said, you know, if you want to talk about this, maybe we could write letters. And so his dad fired off a, a hard question in a return letter, and Greg wrote back a thoughtful response. You know, a letter's nice because you're not spouting off the mouth. You have an eraser. You can kind of fix all that before you send it. Well, this continued for two years, and eventually Ed Boyd, the father, gave his life to Christ. And this book has been published. And uh, I gave this book to my a young neighbor, William, who had the nice truck, and he took it with him. I've given this book to several people. Uh, the lady on the trail uh, has had this book and read it. So um, I, that's just a really, really good thing you can do, especially if you're an introvert. But whatever you do, you need to stay intentional about rubbing shoulders with your friends and family members who are far from God. And it is a skill set that's learned over time. And to be honest with you, it's counter-cultural to American Christianity. Because we think we're different from them. Oh, I'm a Christian. You're a Muslim. Or I don't, I don't go to bars, so I don't talk to you. You need to get used to changing your mentality. I need to get used to changing our mentality. We're going to hear some words we're not used to. We're going to hear some political opinions we're not used to. But we need to look past those things. The author of the book, Bill Heibel, says having an, uh, he describes Jesus as having an uncanny ability to look past the obvious flaws in people's lives. What did people criticize Jesus for in this area? Do you remember? Jesus was criticized for the way he interacted with lost people. He was accused of being a partier. He went to the home of Levi where there were tax collectors and sinners. And the religious elite of the day criticized Jesus for hanging around with the lost. Now part of our timing of this message has to do with a, a fall push. The leaders of the church have been working together to turn our focus outward in the church this fall. And so uh, this is all timed. I want to give you some dates, and I'd like you to write these down. On August 7th, we're going to host a back-to-school blast here at the church. Stephanie and the Children's Church team are working on that. That would be a great time for you to invite a neighbor who has children.
to come to the church. The following Sunday morning, I'm going to start a series on parenting. It'll be a very simple series uh, aimed at people who are not as well acquainted with the church or the Bible and a way to help neighbors in their endeavor to parent. That's going to be August 8th. On uh, September 17th, that's a Friday, that weekend, James is going to be putting together a basketball tournament, right, for the neighborhood. Uh, We don't know if it'll be Friday and Saturday or Friday, Saturday and Sunday. There's even been talk of a chili cook-off. That's one way to ensure my attendance if there's a chili cook-off. But that will be for the neighborhood. There won't be any teaching. There won't be any preaching. Just be a way to build relationships. And then, of course, October 30th will be our uh, trunk or treat. We're working on those plans. You see, whenever you come face-to-face with a neighbor or a friend or a total stranger, there's an enormous responsibility on our shoulders. The great author C.S. Lewis called this the weight of glory. And this comes from uh, his book... um, Where is my footnote? Weight of glory. This comes from uh, Romans 8, 29 and 30. When Paul says, those whom God called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. Now, when we think of glory, we think of God. We don't think of us as receiving glory. But actually, Paul says that when God looks down through history and he sees who will choose him, God predestines us to be glorified. So Lewis writes, The promise of glory is the promised, almost incredible, and only possible by the work of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses, shall actually survive the examination before God, shall find approval, and shall please God. To please God, to be real, a real ingredient in divine happiness. To be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work, or a father in a son. Paul also says in Ephesians that we're God's workmanship. And I used to walk down the intercoastal in West Palm, and we would see an artist sandpapering a wood sculpture that he had been working on in weeks. That's the way God sees us, as a piece of work, an art, a piece of art. I'm a piece of work, you're a piece of art. Lewis goes on to say, it seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain. But so it is. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory. It is hardly possible for us to think too often or too deeply about that of our neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back. A load so heavy that only humility can carry it. And the backs of the proud will be broken. Lewis concludes by saying, The blessed sacrament itself, aside from the blessed sacrament, which here he means communion, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Next to the blessed sacrament, next to actually taking communion, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Because you're... You're standing face to face with someone who God wants to glorify. Now that might be an alcoholic. It might be a neighbor who cheats on his wife. But God tells you to humble yourself and love them. Let's wrap this up by taking out your handout. Take your handout and on it you'll see a list of numbers top to bottom. And... um, at the top, seven, and in the middle, you'll see a zero that says, I think, my choice to follow Jesus. If, you re- if you're old enough, or if you can remember your, your conversion to follow Jesus, write down by the zero whoever it was that initially led you to pray to receive Christ. Write that down. If it was a pastor, a spouse, a parent, who helped you pray to receive Christ? But then think further back and go down to the bottom where it says negative 7. Who is the first person who sort of exposed you to Christ or the Bible or to Jesus or to church 
in a kind way. All they did was expose you to that. Can you remember the first person? I would, I would put my dad down there at the bottom. And at the zero, I would put uh, Pastor Rhodes, who was the pastor under whom I accepted Christ. And then go to the very top, the positive seven. And who in your life most recently has helped strengthen your walk? Take a minute and write those three names in. Now, if you sat at home for an hour and thought about it, do you think you could fill in some of the names in between? Marion, you shook your head. Do you remember, you don't have to tell us, but can you recall in your mind steps before you came to Christ where you began to make that journey? Especially people who decide to follow Jesus as adults look back and they go, well, that person was kind and they were a follower of Jesus and this person handed me a book and this person did that. This is called the one-step process. And what I want you to realize is that when you're kind to your neighbor, and especially if they recognize that you're a follower of Jesus, you've moved them one step. And that's all you need to do. Pastor Jeremy will move them another step. Laurie, their neighbor, will move them another step. And maybe eventually they become comfortable enough to visit church. Maybe they choose Christ here in church. Maybe they choose Christ in the backyard. You're representing Christ and you're loving them just because they're humans and the weight of glory is on them. And by loving them or writing a card, praying for them, hugging them, giving them a book, you're just moving them one step. Rather than seeing them as an evangelism project, that if you don't convert them, then there's a big problem. Let me conclude with this thought. This week, someone mentioned to me the age-old myth, well, this is the pastor's job. This is the pastor's job. We're supposed to come to church. He's supposed to preach a salvation message. He's supposed to go door to door. You know that's not biblical? That is not biblical. Ephesians 4, Paul says that God gave apostles, he gave prophets, he gave evangelists, shepherds and teachers. And I'm a teacher and I've been called here to be your pastor, your shepherd. Why does he do this? Ephesians 4, 12. To equip the saints, that's you, that's me, for the work of ministry. Our job is to teach you and train you this skill set so that you can go do the work of ministry, so that we together can love our neighbors. And he goes on, for the building up the body of Christ. We want our church to grow. The saints, the people in the pews, all of us together are to love our neighborhoods until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So it's not the pastor's job, it's all of our jobs, every Christian's job, to develop friendships and to love our neighbors. Band, would you come? a song of response, a song that we started singing last week, Love Through Me, I think would be an appropriate response as a prayer for us to love our neighbors and ask God to love through us.
let's begin with a, a, a silent period of examination uh, as Jeremy continues to play. He doesn't mind. Let's just take a moment of silence and reflect on the word today and reflect on our week. Maybe there are times this week when you fail the Lord. Or maybe you had a short word with a spouse, short word with a child. Or maybe it's something that you'd be ashamed to admit. Just voice those failures to God right now, those places where you've missed the mark with God. The reason we're here is that Scripture says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I encourage you to confess those sins right now. And if you've never asked Christ into your heart, you can do that today as well. The news of the story of Jesus is too good to be true. That God loves us so much that He would rather die than hold us accountable for our sins. So if that's you, you can pray this prayer with me right now. Father God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. I accept your work of dying for me in my stead so that I can be forgiven of my sin. Please come into my life and make me new. Now as we continue this time of prayer, you can open your eyes now. We're, today is July 4th, and it's an important day of remembrance in our nation. And we're going to show a video calling us to prayer for our nation. And uh, I just want this to be a somber time of remembering what uh, our veterans have done for us. Do we have any veterans in the room? How about, thank you, Don. And how about um, any other veterans? How about spouses of veterans or widows or widowers? We appreciate all the work our veterans have done. I know Floyd served and Floyd's not with us today. He's not been feeling well. But let's watch this video and we'll continue our time of prayer praying for our nation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that over 200 years ago, men and women sacrificed their lives so that we can have a country that is free from religious oppression and taxation oppression. And this country has a long history, Lord. Much of it, good history. But some other times, especially in the last year or two, History that we're not proud of. Lord, this country has only been strong because of what has been put on our coins, on our tender, that in God we trust. So, Father, we call out for our nation that you would revive our nation, that you would help our nation to turn back to you, Lord. That we would put you first, Lord Jesus. And that we would learn to be servants of others, beginning on our street all the way to our capital. Not only being willing to die for our nation, but to die for our neighbor. We pray, Lord, that you would heal our land. 
Lord, we turn our thoughts also to those in the path of this storm, Elsa. And we pray that you would bring peace and, and healing, that the storm would be lessened, it would be calmed. We pray for safety for those in the path of the storm. Lord, we lift up those in our congregation who have been sick. I know Floyd West is still not feeling well, and, and Faye is battling with something right now. But and Jackie aren't here today, and we know they both have health problems, especially Jackie. We pray for healing there, Lord. Lord, I lift up my neighbor Gina, who's about to have surgery. We pray for healing there. And my neighbor Robert Howe, who's battling cancer. Lord, we all pray for this neighborhood, Conway Gardens, Lord Jesus, that you would bless it and bring it to you, Father, and that you would use our church to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. When we came back from COVID, we inverted our service, and now most of our worship is after the message. And so with that, Jeremy's going to continue to lead us. I invite you to stand as we sing, Who am I? Who, I, who you say I am? <laughs>
seated. Ushers, would you come forward? As we come to our offering time, we want to remind guests that giving is the responsibility of regular attenders and members of the church. You're welcome to give, but you're not asked to give at all. These funds go to the betterment of our community, trying to reach the people in our neighborhood. We hope next week to have a box in the lobby out there with a place to make donations for our back-to-school blast. Uh, I'd encourage you to visit a store and maybe purchase a notebook or a backpack um, so that we can bless the children of our neighborhood. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this. We thank you that we are blessed financially. Approximately three-quarters of the world has less money than we do. And we pray that you'd help us to be responsible for these funds, Lord. As they are given today, I pray that you would multiply them and give us wisdom in, in the use of them to bless this neighborhood. In Jesus' name, amen. One, two, three, four.
find a way to reach out to a neighbor in a new way, even if it's just greeting them and asking them to have a good day. Last week, we talked about changing our hearts. This week is developing friendships. Next week, we'll talk about discovering stories. Have a good week. Hey, if you stuck around long enough for the end of this video, I just want to thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. If I could, I just want to take one more second of your time today to ask you and encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts are under the name Oasis at Conway Gardens. And if I could, I want to encourage you to like videos, comment on them, and even share them to your own social media accounts. Now this is not a way for the church to become more popular and we don't make any money off of likes, comments, or shares. This is just a way for us in a digital age to be able to share the gospel. We want to get the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for us out to a broken and hurting world and this is one of the best ways that we can do that. So if you could take just a second to go follow our social media accounts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and maybe the next time you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, comment on it, or share it to your social media accounts if you feel compelled to do so. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.